So in a little while, you will be asked to demonstrate your understanding of Aristotle's theory of tragedy through the modern tragedy assignment. Now, originally I had posted the due date for this as next week, and then I saw what was happening next week, and you're focusing on your play test, and thought it would be a little bit of overkill, and I wouldn't get very quality material from you. So I postponed this a week, which means it's a little bit far off, but I want you to be thinking about it. You can possibly even be working on it. Um, because as with many of my units, a number of these assignments will come due sort of around the same time. And the more you do in advance, the better off you are. So here's your, your assignment. I want you to find a narrative. Notice that's about as specific as I've been. A narrative could be uh, a book. It could be a play. It could be a video game. It could be a movie, a television show, um, a cartoon. Um, it could be a picture book. Mm. Just thinking about how you could use a picture book, but I guess you could use a picture book. Um, find a narrative from the 20th century or later, so something from recent history that fits an important quality of Aristotle's theory of tragedy. Your narrative may be a film, television, blah, 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 blah. Defend your identification through analysis of the story in Aristotle's theory. And basically, you're looking for one of those. Um, so what about the hamartia? Can you identify a narrative in which somebody makes a mistake through a tragic flaw in their character? There's something broken about this person that stimulates conflict? OK, then discuss that. How about peripatia, the tragic irony? Somebody brings about their own downfall. It's their own fault. And it was sort of unavoidable because of who they are. And a neurisis. Can you talk about a moment in a story at which some point or some person realizes their own responsibility, their own guilt in something. Um, and catastrophe, the fall from a great height to a great depth. So the reversal of fortune, where somebody just uh, is on top of the world one moment and down below the world at the next. Which, by the way, you notice the play today, um, Oedipus starts at the, the top of those stairs and then ends below the stage. So there's a physical reminder of that, that fall. Yeah? Um, so for the if we were going to do the tragedy, would the tragedy have to occur, like, did they have to start it really good? And yes. Sort of, and at the end of the road, they had to establish something? Like, yes, know? absolutely. No, no, no. No, tragedies. It can't be, like, in the middle. The catastrophe is at the heart of the tragic ending, the unhappy ending. So there can be no redemption in this story. Yes? Do these, like, the qualities have to be specific in which, like, the hero? Can it be, like, with any other character? Should be the hero. Um, although, here's, here's the problem. Um, I modified this assignment from last year because I tried to make it too specific last year. And then I thought the quality of the writing and the application wasn't what, what I wanted. So I've made it much more general. So your question, Brianne, do I have to be sort of lockstep and uh, apply to the protagonist? I would say you probably should, but there's nothing in the assignment that's requiring you. Because I want you to sort of experiment and be creative with it. Um, being creative with something like this means that you understand the concept such to apply it to a new piece of literature or film or what have you. If you don't understand the concept and you're just sort of shooting in the dark and there's superficial connections, then you're probably not doing as well as you should. <coughs> we'll talk about examples in a moment, but let's go through more in details. And that's what I'd like to spend the class period doing is brainstorming some examples of what might work and what might not. I want a summary of the story in 1 to 200 words, and then the analysis in 4 to 7. It's not a long paper, uh, but I need to know something of the summary. And if you remember uh, the in-class essay where I told you a good introduction to an in-class essay is a summary of the story, that's exactly what I want, about 1 to 200 words on that. And then the 4 to 700 word analysis, um, the brief introduction with claim and conclusion to begin and end the paper. <coughs> Um, consider your work in the in-class writing with theory exercise, which is happening next week. You will earn points here for following the same guidelines. So we'll do an exercise next week that will show you how to write this. Uh, you must use quotation support from Aristotle. Cite that evidence according to the paragraph numbering in the Butcher translation. It's the one you have available online. You may use quotation support from your narrative, but only if you wish. In this case, you use standard MLA citations. So if you're using a picture book, I can't imagine you'd use a quotation. A little tough when the entire story is told through pictures. 
So um, I'm not requiring quotations. I've got a model example online that I can show you and um, standard MLA citations. So that means that I want a work cited page with this. Every time in an English class that you're dealing with more than one work, and here you're talking about Aristotle and your chosen work, at least two, you must have a work cited page for that. Blah, 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 blah. Grading, grading. Initial questions on the, just the nitpicky little details? All right, then hit me with ideas and examples, Alex. Yeah. Where is it? No. That's an excellent point. In fact, Alex, that question, and the question being, how do I incorporate Aristotle into the paper, is exactly the point of next week's writing with theory exercise. So next week, I'm going to teach you how, if you have a theory and you're applying it to a given text, how do you do that? What do the sentences look like? And that's what I'm going to talk about next week. So I'm going to table that question. And I'm going to answer it fully with an in-class activity on Thursday. Okay? Other questions? Got some examples? Yeah, Allie, what do you want to play around with? Okay, remember me. This is a film, you say? Yeah. Uh, hold on a second here. And you're saying that it is cat catastrophe. All right, Allie, your first step is to summarize this story a little bit. So I've, I'm totally unfamiliar with it. Go. Well, it's been a while, so someone can help me. But um, it's just like about a guy and a girl, and they were on a trip, 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 to go with, you know, Twin Towers and just killed it. It's like 9-11. So, he died. So, his father dies during 9-11? No, no, no. Oh, he dies. Okay, so, do we have a name? A name for this character? No, that's not. Okay, still, it's not calm. Um, okay, we'll call, we'll call him Bob. And Bob dies in 9 11. Yes. Does that seem to be coincidental? So it doesn't seem to be like uh, every point of the entire narrative has geared toward him meeting his fate in the Twin Towers. It just happens to be. Do you see where I'm going with that? Yeah. Okay. So here's, here's the difference. And this is excellent. This is why we're having this discussion. Tragedy, as Aristotle says, deals in inevitability. Inevitable. All action has led to this downfall. And the catastrophe at the end is a result of the entire play, that plot, a cause and effect chain, a necessary series of events that train out of control, hitting its end. Melodrama deals in chance. You're talking about melodrama there. Melodrama can be exceptionally sad, but has a different quality to it. So. We have a, a love story and father-son relationship, and then suddenly, oops, sorry, you were in the Twin Towers when 9-11 happened. Right? Does, does, am I making sense on that? Yeah. Okay. So there's the significant difference, and that's why this would not be as good an example of catastrophe. So you're looking for a catastrophe where the fall, the end disaster of the play, 
is brought on by all the events leading up to it. It's a logical conclusion. Give me something else. Catherine. Yes. Um, uh, the, the example that's coming to mind for me being aware of Shakespeare is uh, Shylock and the Merchant of Venice, um, who is characterized as the antagonist. He definitely destroys himself through his own actions, and he goes from being very wealthy um, and powerful to being um, not. Uh, wh who are you thinking of? Voldemort. Voldemort. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, apply this. So. Is Voldemort's end the catastrophe of which Aristotle speaks? Well, the catastrophe's got to be a fall from high to low. And that flows, that, that fall's got to be extreme. So we seem to have an extreme fall, right? Twice in his life. Um, but definitely at the end, we have that, that fall from the height of power to the depth. So we've got that. The catastrophe really works when the catastrophe is the end explosion on a fuse, if you will forgive the cheap metaphor, that has been lit throughout the entire thing. Voldemort's actions, every single one of them, led him to that end, right? There was no other option for him. There was no way that he could sustain what he wanted to sustain. And therefore, in a sense, yeah, his catastrophe is a typical tragic catastrophe. I'd give you that. I'd give you that. Catherine, where does he differ from the tragic model, therefore? Why would he not be, why would he not... Why would his story not work as a tragedy in the Aristotelian sense? Correct, because he doesn't have the construction of the tragic hero that we need. So if he had the construction of the tragic hero, then his story would be a perfect tragedy. But since it's evil, it doesn't work. But it does demonstrate one quality there. So and that's all I need you folks to do. Catherine. Do you have to have like all of these specific No, that's the point. The point is, and that's what I was doing poorly last year when I gave this assignment, is I was giving too many of the qualities. So I just want you to focus on one. But you can acknowledge, as Catherine just did, that the Voldemort story seems to contain the catastrophe and a lot of the other plot events, but it do, or the, the plot elements and the tragic elements, but he's not the tragic hero. But I don't need you to give me the deviation. I just need you to give me what it does have, because it's going to be short. Okay, Paulina. And an erisis? Um, Harry Potter with an ananeurysis. How so? Oh, when he realizes that it's him, that he must uh, sacrifice himself. Sure, I might give you that. Um, and then, and then, what does Rowling do? Rowling gives him a cheap little way out. Uh, a Deus ex machina, by the way. Remember that term we were talking about? The little resurrection stone that saves Harry at the end is a typical deus ex machina. Rowling wanted both, Rowling wanted the best of both worlds. She wanted to kill her character with all the elements of tragedy and not kill him. And some of us who know literature a little bit were like, oh, I love Harry Potter, that was, but that was cheap. Some people say he needed to die. Not because they hated Harry Potter, but just because they said that's how tragedy, that's how these things work. You've got a deus ex machina in there, it's not fair. Adriana. Um, for for Homardia, yes. uh, would the character, the tragic hero, whatever, be able to have like, some kind of flaw of um, maybe like overprotectiveness? Sure. Oh, yeah. That's a flaw. Um, so overprotectiveness actually leading to the demise of the person they're trying to protect? Yeah. Kind of like, all right, so this is about something with um, Simon Nemo. Yes. Like how Marlon is or <coughs> like so overprotective over Nemo that he kind of just like goes out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So let's talk. Let's talk Marlin from. Let's talk Mar Marlin from Finding Nemo. So Marlin obviously con contains a character flaw, and that character flaw leads to the disaster that he faces. 
So it's he that brought that about. Um, we could call it a self-fulfilling prophecy, what have you. Um, I could see that. But there's no catastrophe. That's the point. Okay. Right? So it has no catastrophe, but it has that hum hamartia in the beginning. It has, um, so here's, guys, this is the heart of analytical. Analytical means you take something apart and you see pieces. So let's take a look at one piece of Finding Nemo. One piece of Finding Nemo is that we have a character that's constructed as flawed, and it's his flaw in character that brings about the main conflict of the story. In Oedipus, the main conflict of the story and all the problems that arise can be seen as a consequence of his own pride and his own arrogance. So if Marlin works in the same way, that's fine. But what I don't need you to do for this paper is talk about how it also has another of Aristotle's concepts or another of Aristotle's concepts. That would be fine. Yeah. Um, in my class, I read the, uh, the Green Mile. The Green Mile, yes. Uh, would Hamartia work for John Coffey with his kind of racial bias that he has? Against? He doesn't have a flaw. John Coffey has no flaw. He's definitely a Christ figure, which means that he's somewhat perfect. In fact, he's definitely constructed as perfect. He has no flaw. It's the people around him that have flaws. It's the racism of the community around him that causes his destruction. He does not cause his own destruction. Other people are responsible for it. Okay? Because what did he do? He tried to save the lives of two young women that had been brutally raped and murdered. And he tries his best. And then other people implicate him in the crime, and he's executed. It's not his fault. He tried to do what was right. Uh, more. Carson. Okay. So if I choose to do Inception. Inception. Um, the ending is interpretable. So if the end is incomplete, yeah, it would be one thing. Yes. So uh, summarize a little bit, as best you can, okay. the complicated story of Inception. Well, his tragic flaw is he can't let go of his wife's death, which he caused. Yes. Because, um, it all deals with dreams, so when they went down, they have the ability to go down different dream levels and do their own dreams, so they end up going into limbo, which is like a complete dream state. Mm -hmm. and in that, he plants the mind that, because she doesn't want to leave the place that they're in, so he plants the idea that limbo is not real, but that idea sticks with her, so even when they get back to reality, she believes that it is false reality, so she commits suicide to escape. Okay, so there seems to be an element of irony here that seems ultimately tragic, right? Because tragedy is often steeped in irony. Peripatia, the tragic irony. So let's analyze it for a moment. He, in an attempt to save his wife, pushes her to commit Suicide. That's basically it. Here, honey, I'm going to save you. It's a complex psychological dream-based trick. When she wakes up, the dream-based trick is still in there and actually causes her to throw herself out of a window. All right? So there's irony. He has, so that might be the peripatia. Unfortunately, he's not causing his, well, you could say he's causing his own downfall. Because when he, kill, when he causes his wife to die, basically it destroys his entire life. And you're right, Carson, that if you interpret the ending in a certain way, he never has any redemption. So is it okay if I write a paper on that? Is yeah. That valid? Yeah. This is peripatia. <laughs> Causes his own downfall. Who's responsible for this man's devastation or destruction? His wife? No. The people that, uh, um, that he was working for? No. Ultimately, it's him that did this. It was his action that directly led. And moreover, and here's what I want you to understand, it's the way the film tells that story that definitely sh shows that he's the one at fault. Because they focus on his guilt, his responsibility for it. Uh, excellent. Yeah. Oh. Casey. Uh, like with trading places. <laughs> How many of you have seen the classic Trading Places? Really? That's sad. <laughs> that is sad. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's not appropriate for school. It's oh, you guys have seen much worse. It's actually pretty tame. But um, tell the story a little bit. Like I haven't seen it in like six years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm really fuzzy on it. So like Dan Aykroyd is 
really meant. Yep. And they're being like, uh, on their phones. Right. And, uh, I don't remember what happened, but like, something makes me alive, like, would. Yep. Would a Maddie Mason come break the band and really go to, like, the highest of the world? Correct. Um, so, here's what, uh, I'll, I'll fill in some of the blanks. First of all, there's a racial element to this as well. Because Dan, Ar Dan Aykroyd's white, Eddie Murphy's black, and these two guys behind the scenes have a, a disagreement. They say that, you know what, it's breeding, it's, it's your birth that gives you wealth and power. And s some other guy says, no, it's, it's totally circumstance. You put anybody in a certain situation, they'll succeed. You give anybody wealth and power, and they'll be wealthy and powerful. So they decide to play this game by trading these people and see if the rich guy will become a vicious criminal, and the vicious criminal will become an upstanding rich guy by flipping them around. So it's a social experiment. And um, so we do have Dan Aykroyd's character going from up here to down here. Um, he starts very rich, and then he is very ha unhappy, um, very poor, destitute, loses everything. But here's the problem. Then he decides to work together with Eddie Murphy, and they both become rich and happy. And the other guys become poor. So I, I was looking for the catastrophe, because you were talking about going from high to low. Unfortunately, that's only a moment early on in the story that eventually reverses again. So I think if you're looking for a catastrophe, you'd have to look for the catastrophe at the end. Dan Aykroyd would have to end as a beggar rather than. Does that make sense? Okay, so there we go. Paulina. Hey, um, I was just wondering if the uh, type of catastrophe and the boy in the great chest that one is like, inevitable. Oh, that one's good. Um, Okay, hold on. This will be of interest to you Antigone readers in the room because I see this as functioning in much the same way. But Paulina, talk to me a little bit about, well, tell the room a little bit about the story and then talk to me a little bit about what you're thinking. I don't know. The, uh, Bruno, Bruno. Bruno, Bruno. Bruno, okay, so his dad uh, was so back in like, the times of the Holocaust and this little boy, he moved into with his parents to like, he's in the middle of nowhere. So he, he's really like bored because he left a lot of his friends back home and he's in the middle of like, it's pretty much like in a field somewhere. And um, so he just goes exploring and it's like he finds out that next to his house is a, is a, a, a concentration camp. But he doesn't know what that is. He doesn't know what it is. Right. He thinks it's like a great place because there's a bunch of people there. He thinks, he thinks you know, it's like, why am I here when I could be over there and talk to all those people? And there are kids there. And he doesn't have any play, anybody in front of him. With um, one of the kids. And then, uh, well, a lot of stuff happens. And then at the end, he ends up going inside to help his friend that he made look for his dad. And at the end, he pretty much just dies because he went in the gas shower. Because they think he's one of the inmates. Yeah. yeah he's he puts on um, the right, puts on the clothes, puts on the striped pajamas. What are you thinking in terms of the application of concept? Let's think more of um, the hamartia and the tragic irony, the peripatia. Whose fault is it? The boy? Yeah, it's Hitler's fault. Everything's Hitler's fault. <laughs> Bruno dies. Antigone dies. Whose fault is Antigone's death? Anybody finish it? It's Creon's fault. Hey, um, once again, this uh, this whole spoiler alert thing, remember that what we're doing in this class is not predicated upon surprise and shock. And somebody, I can't remember who it was, commented to me on leaving today, um, 
Mr. Clarkson, thank you for telling us that story before we went in there, because if you hadn't, I would have had no clue what was going on. Yeah. And Ms. Belak's students had not heard the story, so they were probably pretty confused. So it's another interesting social experiment. Um, the analysis of literature, the analysis of literature requires that we understand and unfold these surprises, these shocks. When we're just being entertained, yeah, sure. But here, we need to understand, you need to understand going into a study of Antigone, what happens in Antigone. It's a tragedy. She dies. There's no happy ending here. But the more important issue is who's responsible. So Creon's responsible for Antigone's death. He's the one that laid out the law that resulted in her death sentence. He's the one that carried out the order for the execution. He's the one that went to save her too late. Everything that happens to her is, is basically his fault. Whose fault is it here? Not Hitler. Specifically, Dad. Bruno's dad. Why? Because Bruno's dad is an SS commandant of a concentration camp that claims his son. There's the tragic irony, is that dad has taken part in a, a war machine to destroy innocent human lives. He has committed to that. He has made this mistake, if you will. And that mistake claims the life of his son. Now, Creon doesn't die in Antigone, and yet he loses everything. He loses his son. He loses his niece. Um, he loses his wife. He loses the respect of his kingdom. He's alive, but he might as well not be. He's kind of like Oedipus, right? He's alive, but oh, well, oh, happy day. Um, Dad's alive, but Dad has just lost his son. And I know that none of you have kids yet. Trust me, I noticed once I had a child the difference when people say things like that. Wow, that's huge. That's just like you'd rather be dead. And then in that situation, you'd rather be dead. So dad is responsible for his own son's unjust murder. I think that's tragic irony. That's hamartia. That's perfect. That's Creon right there. In fact, that's Creon to a T. Yeah. True. Um, if you said the curiosity was a bad thing, I think arrogance you know, on Oedipus' part is a bad thing. I think Creon's inflexibility, his inability to see past laws and rules, is a bad thing. Um, I think Jason's ambition in Medea is a bad thing. So all these character flaws are bad things. I'm not sure curiosity is a bad thing. In fact, what Bruno demonstrates throughout the entire um, novel and film is uh, a, a need to play with other kids, just sort of this un enduring love for other people. I, I think that he's seen as a perfect per person. You could see also Antigone. Antigone actually commits a crime. Those of you reading the play know that she decides to bury her brother. Her brother's a traitor to the state, and Creon has said that he cannot be buried, must rot on the battlefield. And Antigone says, no, you know what? That's my brother. And I love him. No matter what he did, I'm going to go bury him. I'm going to give him religious rights, make sure that he goes to the underworld just fine. And she does. Is that a mistake? No, no, no. She's obeying the gods, and she's loving her brother. Both of those led to her demise, but neither of those is a bad thing. Bruno's curiosity is not a bad trait. His father's, whatever you want to call it, um, is bad, is a, is a negative trait. So there's your flaw. Do you have a quick question? Because Yeah. Yep. You could. Um, I'd like you to fo I, I, I want you to focus on at least one. If you feel that you want to cast your net a little wider and show how this one relates to this one, because they're all related, right? I mean, Aristotle's theory shows this machine that's related. But what um, Catherine has pointed out is that this paper only requires you to look at a part. The machine must, need not be totally assembled in order for you to write this paper. But if you feel it is, go for it. Sure. Yes. Uh, the other Berlin girl. Um, sure. I'm trying to remember the story. It's like most Elizabethan melodramas just sort of washes away in my brain. Um, 
Yes, her ambition eventually, she's executed, right? Yeah. Okay. Like most of his wives. Um, she was a Henry VIII wife, right? Yeah. Okay. So the other Boleyn girl, her ambition throughout the entire story eventually lands her at the chopping block. So sure, you could talk about that as peripatia as well. Ambition being a negative trait, so that would work. Um, um, I don't know. I've not seen it yet. Uh, yes, but I wouldn't say that my I saw each of them once. I wouldn't say my memory is very good. Most action films like that just sort of blend into each other after a while for me. I enjoy them, but I don't really see them as identifiable. Um, so possibly. Uh, I'll tell you what, let's see how much time we have left and how much you can describe it. Two minutes? Okay, so Autumn, if you want to talk with me about that personally, that's great. Um, but any quick questions about the assignment or just quick ones you want to throw out? Tim, quickly. It's not his fault. It's the fault of Big Brother. Yeah, but disobeying the law, as in the case of Antigone, if you're disobeying the law to stand up for what's right, you've not made a mistake. Other people have made mistakes. And besides, where does Winston go? Does Winston face any catastrophe? He's gone from being a slave to being a dead slave. It's not much of a catastrophe, right? Does he? Is there ever? Do you think there's ever a moment in 1984 that Winston is truly free? I think that every single moment of his life was accounted for by Big Brother. I don't know. We could we could debate it, but here's here's the point, Tim. For a paper like this, <coughs> I'm not sure how much you want to involve yourself with a text that might seem unclear in its application. So you might want to find something that's a little bit clearer in application. Sheridan. A, a story of what? That doesn't seem like a character flaw. It seems like a mental illness. <laughs> okay. Are you sure? Okay. We can talk more about it later.